everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction, Luis. Um, I would like to present to you today our work on XDGGS, a community developed X array package to support planetary DDGS data cube computation. This is a really long title, even more authors. Um, I'll get a little bit more into the background just you know, to catch up. So X array is a really, really widely used um, library, Python library, for uh, working with um, arrays. It's uh, in, the, in the Earth's observation community is really widely used um, in the like, Pangeo and Jupyter ecosystems for, for data cube um, calculations in the climate space as well. DGGS means uh, discrete global grid systems and it's a sort of new form of uh, spatial reference system. And uh, in the BITS conference, Big Data from Space, last year in November in Vienna, shout out to Stefanie Rumnitz, um, three big communities came together, the OGC Geospatial uh, Consortium, where I'm also uh, here, disclosure, uh, co-chair of the District Global Grid Systems Working Group. Then there's also Peter Strobel from JSC. Pangeo developers, especially here and for you, Tina Odaka and uh, Ryan. And um, this all happened at the joint Pangeo OSGO code sprint. So I was there sitting also with Tom Karelidis trying to hack something into PyGIP IP as well. So what is Pangeo? Because we are on the PhosphorG, which is an OSGO conference. Pangeo is an international community of a bit more geoscience related um, open source, inclusive, um, and scalable sort of software for planetary and, and, and large environmental, et cetera, data um, computation. It's strongly Python, but there's also Julia and, and R. So it's, it's, it's more computation and, and programming. Um, and there's a huge ecosystem, and I'm 100% sure most of you will have been in touch with some of those. Uh, if you have worked with Jupyter, scaling out with Dask, X-Array, um, and the you know, whole matplotlib and, and pi visualization things. The nice thing is with this type of ecosystem is you can develop on your computer, scale it then out on HPC or on cloud using the same stack, which is really nice. So a quick background on X-Array. So X-Array is a little bit of a foundation in, in, in many workflows, scientific uh, workflows. It's an open source project that's already around a while and it's for n-dimensional labeled arrays. So if you have worked with uh, Rasta, you have loaded Rasta as a NumPy array, for example, into, into memory, then you sort of know where we are at. And, and this takes it to a whole other level. You can chunk it out of core uh, larger and larger. And um, it provides labels, so it's, you don't have to know the index number and the index of the array. So this helps you really, really um, to, to program with that, and it's, it's included, integrated with a lot of other packages. Okay, so this is sort of the background. This is status quo, widely used. Then what I describe global grid systems, it's um, a, as I said, a spatial reference, a new type of spatial reference. We can see a bit of a hybrid uh, between vector and raster, uh, with the idea that um, the, the cells or pixels that um, cover the whole globe have the approximately or almost the, the, the same area. The Open Geospatial Consortium has put that already into a so-called abstract specification that becomes also an ISO standard. And uh, they call it, it's a discrete global grid system, it's a spatial reference system that uses a hierarchical tessellation of cells to partition and address the globe. So what does that mean? Hierarchical means you have, as you can see on the right side, um, at different resolutions, very similar to the like, zoom levels if you have uh, web tiles, for example. Um, partition means you know you have subsets that cover, that refer to a certain area on the globe. And address means each cell, each pixel has a unique ID. This gives, um, this property gives some really, really nice um, um, data management things that you can associate lots of data to a certain not only a point, but a certain area on Earth that is uniquely identified indexable. So um, this has also been recognized um, by the United Nations um, experts on global geospatial information management, GGM, that we indeed need to combine more and more tabular and spatial data. 
But the challenge we often run in, especially in terms of spatial units, we have um, polygons of different shapes and sizes, administrative boundaries are of course not the same area, so dealing with area statistics, you know, you always have a couple of uh, trip, trip wires, you have to normalize and so on. Uh, then we have rasters, even if, like we do in data cube computations, if we align raster, if we have rasters of same resolution, let's say 10 meter, the rasters also have to be aligned and in the same coded reference system in order that you can do a proper drill down. Choosing a DGGS, um, that is sort of taken care of you, take care of for you, that because, the, as I said, the cells are uniquely identifiable, they're always in the same place. Uh, if you then decide to uh, integrate data with one of these, uh, you can then also do summary aggregations to the coarser resolutions. So um, this, this, uh, yeah, this uh, provides a nice framework, uh, especially for, for data integration. So um, maybe to visualize it a little bit, um, the actual gridding problem. So uh, one big use case is also increasingly with um, the statistical agencies in Europe. So we have Eurostat for all of Europe. They, of course, have a statistical grid um, that is based on the European uh, code reference system, the ETRS 30, 34, uh, 35. Um, then uh, if we want to use uh, satellite data, we have um, Sentinel-2, for example, in UTM. The UTM different zones, and if we go t further to the north, even those zones are overlapping. So there's oversampling. Um, it has to be resampled into your data cube because you have to decide usually which projection do you use, you know, continental or, or local projection. So you have to usually fit everything into that one. And that projection can usually not be too big, otherwise you run into aerial distortions. So and on the right side, um, for example, in, in, in hexagonal-based DGGS, that would look the same always the vertices would always be in the same location, so you wouldn't run anymore into, into such issues. So um, in terms of hierarchical, so multi-zoom, that sounds a bit uh, fancy here. So um, as, you, as you sort of aggregate data, you can do different um, data variables you know, at different zoom levels. Then uh, you zoom in, and then this would be Estonia, and then as you zoom in, you can, you know, you have still a structured uh, grid, which is good. And here, as, as, a, as a maybe helper, like you have cell IDs that refer to a, a place on Earth and you associate arbitrary information. You can even technically, you know, as you want your table to be. Um, uh, and another thing is combining data from different sources. So let's assume like ESA does right now, having a study, uh, having Sentinel data available in ATGGS, you wouldn't download the whole UTM zone of, of three to, to seven gigabytes, you would just select, I need only the data for these and these zones, then for these and these cells, and then you have maybe uh, from the statistical office population data, and you know, and because of the IDs, you can do a simple table join. Um, dealing with uh, discrete global grid systems, so things you typically have to do is uh, producing data sets. And, and right now we're at the situation, obviously we don't have data collection at the DGGS level. So we only have vector data and we have raster data. So right now we have to do regridding. Funny though, the Pangea uh, community, which is very active also in the, in, the, in the climate and ocean space, they do regridding all the time because all their climate and ocean grids are actually at different resolutions, different grids. So they do that all the time anyway. So um, they, they know about that. Uh, for many statistical things, uh, species, population, we do binning, like we do nowadays also already. We do point data binning into um, spatial bins, like squares or hexagons. And then things you want to typically do is you, you do aggregations over larger areas. Um, you want to have cell boundaries, neighbors. Um, a nice thing also is with hexagonal topologies is you don't run anymore into the four or eight neighborhood. So technically, you always have direct neighbors across all. Uh, and typical other things uh, you can do, uh, of course, also geometric operations like cell overlap, intersection, and so. And you have to eventually store that. And uh, with XDGS, 
with XDGGS now being an extension to X-Array, you basically still work in X-Array. Yeah? So you have um, your coordinates, your dimension, but that uh, dimension, that main uh, dimension that we came up with would be the cell ID, which is basically a 1D array, and all your data is associated to the cell ID. So then you just have to store it in a meaningful container, like uh, that, that supports array data and meaningful metadata. So the NetCDF model has been inspiring for, 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 you know, for this type of data. We would, of course, take it then further and, and store it in chunked arrays in ZAR. Um, I'll come to that a little bit later. But here, this is uh, anyone who has ever opened an X, a data set with X-Array knows how, what this means. You have the coordinates and then you have the data variables. So here it's the air temperature that is uh, indexed against um, the cell ID only. And the funny thing is from the cell ID, you can always go back to the location. So here we don't need lab longs or anything else. So one thing that we have to do is when we start right now, we have to convert data into DGGS. So what we do right now is, for example, for rasters, uh, we take the centroids and then we derive the, the, the cell IDs. There's a whole other thing that I have to probably write about is uh, you know, the different ways to consider when converting different types of data and especially at different resolutions uh, into a DGGS system. Then, um, so one funny thing here is, uh, as you can see, so the data is indexed as DGGS, you only have cell IDs, but you still can do a query on coordinates because you know, I know, um, Tartu is around 27 by 57.6 or something, um, let long, and um, that would be co uh, converted into the corresponding uh, DGGS uh, cells, uh, zone uh, identifiers, and this way you could st you would still do a spatial uh, subset. So the the finding of location via cell ID is still at the base of it. Uh, and and inversely, if you need to go back to Ledland space, you can always get the cell boundaries, which are the the polygons or the cell centroids. Uh, as let long um, out because the, the DGGS systems intrinsically know that conversion. It's basically like projections where you know that uh, at that index, you know, um, with like some geo origin, the conversion, you can go back and forth. So the math is, so to say, stable. So in order to save that um, meaningfully, so we have been experimenting uh, with ZAR. I mean, ZAR itself doesn't need experimenting in itself anymore. It's, it's a fairly trusted um, uh, data format to store arrays, and it does it chunked, so it's cloud optimized. You put it in, in cloud buckets, for example, and similar with cloud optimized geotiffs, you don't need to read the whole file. You're only, based on the metadata, you only go to the chunks that you need. And um, it also supports compression of the chunks, so it's actually pretty, pretty um, space-wise space, space -wise pretty okay. And similar, because being inspired, sort of inheriting from NetCDF and CF conventions, uh, you can have a lot of uh, metadata associated. And this is really important, because right now, the state of defining the configuration of a DGS is still a little bit, um, I wouldn't say fragile, but every library and every um, um, system needs a couple of specific parameters. Uh, would be nice maybe to have that approach at some point or something in this direction, like a, like a nicer uh, catalog of, of that. I mean, there's not so many, it's maybe, it's maybe a handful, but some of those have a couple um, configuration option where the origin is, uh, a rotation of the thing, or um, if the indexing goes, you know, space field curve like this way or, or this way nested or, you know, those types. That needs to be stored, of course, with the, as metadata, as sort of coordinate reference information with the um, container. And then ZAR provides uh, the means for that. Um, right now, um, here, my colleague uh, has been helping super. So we are, we are working with uh, DigiGrid, which is uh, a still currently a command line tool. We are working with Kevin Zar also 
and making it more of a library, then you would have a nice C++ library for that. Uh, H3 might be a thing you have already come across. And others are um, R Helpix and Helpix, which are um, originating actually from astronomy, from you know looking outward and tessellating the sphere as you look outward, and then sort of making it useful for um, looking onto the Earth. So uh, one interesting bit uh, that we also did in the paper is, uh, I, I had a paper a few years back when I assessed the aerial distortions of, of different DGS systems, and uh, at that time I missed Hilpix, so we added that in that paper as well. And as you can see, where's the thing here? This is the... Yeah, no, and actually it's a point here. So here's heel peaks. So you see it's, it's really, really good also, um, similar to like the hexagonal ones, uh, hexa, hexagonal here, hexagonal ones. So that, that's pretty good. Um, that is also documented in, in the article. And uh, why is it interesting? Because uh, although heel peaks is really used in astronomy, um, the, some digital twin, especially in Europe, we have the digital twin thing um, going on with destination Earth, uh, Green Deal, uh, and climate data spaces. And uh, the colleagues, here, Tina from, from Ifremer, they, uh, they took Helpix and they do some amazing things with it. So that's why um, I want to show this here as well. And that's why we thought it really important also to mention Helpix as an additional DGGS. And then a quick update on DGGrid. So DGGrid actually is 10 or 20, 10 years, 10 years, recently had the 10 year anniversary and um, is now just in a almost released version 8.1 um, where some additional improvements on, on ICS 7H. So that is a, a similar configuration like H3, but H3 is not equal area so much. So that's why we put this extra effort in and working with the DG grid. And there are some nice addressing schemes for ICS 3H and ICS 7H for um, really having these uh, indices um, being meaningful parent-child relationships. So you can find the children that are related to, to one zone at the next resolution. And, and vice versa, you can find their parents, so you can do group by by parents and so on. And we're working, as I said, towards Python bindings. So that uh, having Python bindings in this case means actually having C compatible bindings uh, that we would hope will open up a whole new um, usability in, in a different programming languages. Some examples, uh, inspiration, how we have uh, used, uh, not only we, but uh, so on the lower right, uh, it's a suitability analysis uh, for fuel station suitability location in, in Northern Europe. So a classic suitability analysis like in Rasta you do, you have all these variables and then you calculate the weighted suitability on top. And because it's so easy, do a tabular in a store like ClickHouse database. Other companies, startups use uh, also hexagonal ones to integrate different types of satellite imagery like Planet and Sentinel to do their modeling. Here, um, you know, you can find this particular paper here. And uh, uh, pip install xdgs um, that will actually, I think, only come per default with H3. So we are working on the DigiGrid implementations, and uh, Ifremer is working on the Helpix stuff. So some stuff is obviously still moving. And uh, with that, I have done my 20 minutes. <laughs> I was wondering if you, you have compared the efficiency of a compression algorithm when you store as a, a DGGS indexed data set rather than a classical raster. D does it affect the compression, classical compression method like deflate or, or whatever? And most certainly there are some options you cannot 
that use like uh, algorithms that are designed for 2D data, like J JPEG compression or JPEG 2000 or stuff like that. So, w what are your thoughts about compression yeah. and yeah. DGGS uh, friendly storage? Yeah, oh, so that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so, the format option versus the data indexing type, so to say. So right now we mostly work in, in, in uh, two, let's say, two main types. One is ZAR, and uh, ZAR compression um, is, is fairly good, and you use the things that come with the ZAR package, like BLOSC and, and, and ZLib or ZSTD. Um, so those ones at the similar resolution, so that you have a similar number of pixels, so to say, and you have the similar number of values, um, behaves fairly similar. Then uh, another one would be um, Parquet. Parquet also has a pretty good compression, but if you're purely tabular, um, in uh, Vinza you would have maybe additional dimensions like time, which you can't sort of model in Parquet purely. And uh, last but not least, uh, purely operational, so ESA and um, the testbed 16 with GeoServer, and we also, as an operational data store, we use ClickHouse, and the ClickHouse database has also is an OLAP data database and it also has really good uh, compression. So, loading the data in, if you purely from a raster point of view, um, it stays at, at simi similar compression. But but the the concept is slightly different. So it's not a purely a binary blob like you, let's say that is you know compressed like like um, like a TIFF for example or something like this. So um, and. A more interesting question that I had uh, the other day is uh, computational efficiency. So, like a certain algorithms that work on rasters based on the on the 2D axis, um, they would probably well they would not work for hexagons. Obviously, they could work for quadrilateral ones, uh, but um, there's also algorithms for hexagonal. But um, the data access, the the I think this is not as mature yet. So, but uh, with X array DGGS, um, being able to use the general scientific ecosystem of X array and the way X array shuffles, you know, stuff around, um, this is a good way for right now to explore um, that a bit more in, in operational space, so to say. So we are very lucky that from last year now we move actually from a more scientific theoretical point of view, I mean, Luis has followed the progress. Um, we're going now to trying to really do stuff with it. Okay, so let me just add to this that if you're storing this data in still in the raster concept, usually what happens is that you transform a zone into a one dimension array. Okay. And so when you do that transformation, there are some methods from traditional 2D raster that you use. But you still can use all And Jerome saint from Gnosis is studying this thing for that. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, just wait for the microphone. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to make sure about uh, Hillpix. Uh, is it uh, right now supported to deal with uh, Hillpix or it's going to be developed? So you're asking if uh, this can be used with heel picks? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if Remer is using it, I'm not right sure. So Justus, I'm not Justus Magin, has um, done a couple pull requests. He's, he's, he and Benoit are like the main maintainers to make sure which, data, which code goes in. So I'm not sure at which stage the operational uh, stuff is indexed. We have right now a little bit of situation because we have some heavy dependencies. So each of these DGGS systems, except maybe H3, uh, come with their own heavy dependencies. Like um, heel picks or CDS heel picks is fairly heavy package. DGGrid comes with its own challenges. Um, so there, right now, the way the Python packages are set up with the dependencies, um, we don't want to pull in all those things. So we have to modularize this a little bit. But in general, they are working with it, and, and they do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you.